You know, it's a wonderful thing. Y'all decided to come to church today. The place is almost full. So we're, we're excited to have you in first service at Cross Point Church. And uh, we're finishing up a series that kind of evolved. We started off calling it miracles, and then we got into some other things, and it's focused more on the life of Elijah. And so it ended up being because it just seemed appropriate when all hell breaks loose. Anybody ever been there? Uh, It's centered around, again, the life of the great prophet Elijah. God used him to manifest miracles, but all along the way, Elijah had to deal with uh, opposition and conflict. And that came from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who set up a godless government in Israel. And we got them back up here one more time. It's a little eerie, isn't it? It it is. Uh, Elijah faced demonic opposition, and we're going to face it in our lives as well. Uh, We talked about how Satan sends demons to assault people and the effect of spiritual, physical, relational, uh, financial, and even mental, which is the focus of our message today. Uh, Mental health issues in our society have seen a staggering increase. And we could talk about a whole lot of things as as it falls under that category, but depression, uh, suicidal ideation, anxiety, all, all sorts of issues You know, I believe the Bible is the most honest book ever written. It presents human history in raw, unedited form. It's another reason why I believe in the credibility of scriptures. It gives us the most transparent glimpse into the heart and the worst, into the best and worst days of of people as as it's recorded. So today I'm giving you a front row seat into the worst day of Elijah's life based on how he recorded or how he talked about it. This powerful prophet has has seen God show up miraculously over and over, but on this day, he hits rock bottom. Uh, He feels drained, depleted, and defeated. He's not confident. He's not secure. He is not whole. He's broken, busted. He's bruised. He's battered. And the reality is, sometimes the godliest people you think you know are people who suffer Seasons of setbacks, struggle, discouragement, depression, and even despair. Okay? A few examples from scriptures that might surprise you. The prophet Jeremiah, uh, he writes about lamenting, and he's a weeping prophet. So every day for him is an emotional day. Uh, It's difficult. He struggles. So in Jeremiah 20, 14, he's wrestling with God, and he's asked basically to, to paraphrase, why are you so frustrated? What's going on? And he said, because God did not kill me in the womb. If he would have just allowed that to happen, then I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be going through all this. I wished I hadn't have been born. And and then there's the great man of God, Job. We've all read his story. He suffers catastrophic loss. All of his children die. Satan afflicts his body with painful boils and, and sores. And his reputation is destroyed. And Job 3 and 1 says, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. I wished I had not been born is what he's basically saying. The great apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 8, Paul says we were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life. In other words, we can all identify with this, I believe. Have you ever been overwhelmed to the point that you were despaired of life? And, you know, like I don't have it in me to fight this anymore. Anybody ever felt like that? I mean, I've been there more often than, than I can count. But a lot of Christians are taught to put their happy face on and to fake it on Sundays. That's why more of you did not raise your hand. (laughs) But regardless of of what you encounter in the room, everyone here is fighting a battle of some kind. We all face adversities. We all face struggles. We all face conflict in our lives. Uh, Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, he publicly professed that he was frequently on the border of despair. He battled depression regularly. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, confessed his struggle with depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, we often refer to him as the prince of preachers, but he struggled with depression, uh, including debilitating physical setbacks. Uh, he, He had so many physical problems. He actually died at 58 years old, a very young man when he passed away. And I don't know if this is your experience, but it certainly has been mine. When you're struggling or hurting or suffering, or you find yourself in a very dark place, religious people can be the absolute worst. 
Amen? Why? Because they tend to weaponize the Word of God. We've talked about this, but they'll use the Bible like a sledgehammer when you're already feeling beat up. Amen? Uh, you know, it's stuff like this. Philippians says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So you need to get over it. You just need to get over it. Get up and get going and rejoice. That's weaponizing the Word of God. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's hitting people really hard when they're down. You got to know the right scriptures for the right time to minister correctly the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Did you know there are over 60 scriptures in the Gospels that talk about Jesus' emotional life? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are basically biographies of the life of Jesus. And here's a few examples. And there's many, over 60, but I'll give you just a few. Matthew 26, uh, 37, 38. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Jesus said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. In Luke 12, 50, Jesus said, how great is my distress. And then in John eleven thirty three, 33, he says, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Isaiah prophesied and said, when Jesus comes, uh, he's going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Some of you have been told that those are not Christian emotions. Okay, but they were Jesus' emotions. Amen? So, so there are moments in Jesus' life where he is celebrating, and there are other times when he is weeping. And that's my setup for today's story about Elijah's spiritual depression. Now, Elijah had days of victory, and he had days where he felt utterly defeated. Uh, let's do a real quick review for those that haven't been here to be a part of this series, and, and I'll try to catch you up as, as best I can. Ahab was a demonic passive king who ruled over Israel with his demonic controlling wife, Jezebel, okay? Uh, they hated God. They hated God's people. They hated God's word. And Elijah was sent by God with a specific mission to oppose them. Now, there's intense conflict between Elijah and the godless government of Israel. Uh, after three and a half years of drought, Elijah summons the false prophets of Baal to a showdown on Mount Carmel. And we've talked all about this, where the, the temples of Baal and Asherah were located and they'd set up altars to these false gods of Baal and Asherah who were the gods of fertility or uh, you know, uh, sexual promiscuity because they used to have all kind of orgies and different things there. And I even told you that they would take the offspring, the children born from those illicit sexual encounters, and they would throw them on the altar to Baal and sacrifice them there. Horrific, horrific practices under these godless rulers in Israel. So Elijah, used mightily by God, publicly humiliates Queen Jezebel's false prophets. The people witnessed the power of God. You know, he called down fire from heaven, and uh, God showed up powerfully for Elijah, but the false prophets didn't show up uh, for Baal. Uh, then they, they, they turn on the uh, false prophets of Baal after they see that Elijah's God is, in fact, the true and living God. They turn on them and they slaughter them all. And 450, they basically have their throats cut right there that day. And we don't know if Elijah was a part of that or, uh, you know, if he stood by and kind of it was a mob mentality. We don't know. We don't have an answer for that. But Ahab comes home after this slaughter of the 450 prophets that Jezebel had been instrumental in putting together. He comes home. He walks through the front door and Jezebel says, well, welcome home, baby. How did it go? And Ahab says, well, not so good. Not so good. Our prophets were defeated by Elijah. They were humiliated and slaughtered. Then our people repented, declared Baal to be a false god, and turned their hearts to, to Elijah's God. Now, again, Ahab is passive. So in my mind, at least how I think this plays out, he's decided that he's just going to move on. You know, he's going to cut his losses and he's going to move on. Jezebel, however, she's controlling. She's not willing to let it go. Uh, she's not about to give up quite so easily. She's got more to say. And she begins to plot her revenge against the prophet Elijah. And that's where we pick up the story today in this concluding sermon that's going to be absolutely spectacular. Y'all ready for this? All right. 1 Kings 19 verses 1 through 8 is our text today. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. And he's, he's kind of like baby Elijah. He's a lot tougher than what we thought he was. 
Verse 2, then, then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah because she's not giving up. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also. I want, you, I want to focus on this because we miss this point a lot of times. This woman is demonic to the core. You agree with that? We've seen that. I mean, the, the things that she's done. This is her last big push against Elijah, and this gal goes all in. What do I mean by that? Uh, I want you to notice her words. She said, so may the gods do to me and more also. She, she does exactly what Judas Iscariot would do some years later. She makes a deal with the devil. She makes a pact with the devil. She says, I told Satan, if you're not dead in 24 hours, he can do whatever he wants to to me because I'm going to make sure you're a dead man. So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, all those 450 you killed, you're going to end up just like them by this time tomorrow. So now has all, she now has all the uh, available resources in the nation and the demonic realm focused on Elijah. And Elijah, and this is important, I'm going to bring this up several times in this message, Elijah is standing all alone as the prophet of God. He's standing all alone, okay? And she loudly proclaims, you killed our prophets, so I promise you this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut your throat within the next 24 hours, and I'm going to do to you what you did to them. You're as good as dead. And there's a massive bounty, a hit, that's put on Elijah. Uh, he's a well-known public figure. Everybody knows who he is now. He's just, he's just publicly humiliated uh, Jezebel's false demonic gods of Baal and Asherah and, and killed all and stood by at least while all of the 450 prophets were slaughtered, which makes it even harder to believe what happens next. Okay? Verse 3, then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life. Then he was what? He was afraid. Are you telling me that you can call down fire from heaven one day and then be full of fear the next God shows up on your behalf one day and then you doubt if he'll ever show up again? Are you telling me that's a possibility and that people live that way? After everything God has done, Elijah's going to run scared now. He's going to run scared. And he arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. Here's the second mention of this unnamed servant. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he goes deep into the woods. And let's unpack that a little bit because this is important uh, information that I don't, want, I don't want you to miss. Keep in mind, Elijah was a, a rugged outdoorsman. This guy is someone who, who lived in caves and lived off the land. He wasn't a weekend camper. He was a wilderness warrior, okay? This is his lifestyle. So he goes back to what he knows. He goes deep into the wilderness. Y'all tracking? Okay, uh, and, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and those trees would grow anywhere from three feet all the way up to about 12 feet tall, and they had mostly yellow type flowers uh, that would bloom on them on occasion. And I just looked that up, and since I took the time to look it up, I thought I'd tell you about it. <laughs> so he came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough, O Lord, take away my life. He's not ending his own life. He's not talking about suicide here. But, but he's okay if God ends his life. He's okay if God does it. He's like, God, can all this that has come against me, can this stuff just end? Would you please just take me out of this mess? And it's okay with me if you just end it for me today. And I'm going to tell you something. There are some people in this life that, it know, that can identify with this different circumstances, but the same vibe. I, Lord, I'm just tired. You know, if, it's, if you want to take me, I'm okay with it. I've... I've done all that I can do. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of the turmoil. I'm tired of the, the despair. I'm tired of the loneliness. I'm just tired, and it's okay with me if you just get me out of this mess. Lord, <clears throat> you know, I'm rapture ready, and I'm sick of, of this godless world we live in and the hateful, mean people that occupy it. It's okay to say amen there. If you could give me anything I ask today, I'd like to leave. I'm tired of being here. He's basically saying enough is enough, right? Elijah said, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. <clears throat> now, you know you're tired when you fall asleep in the woods under a broom tree. 
You're in the wilderness and you fall asleep there. You're just done. Verse 5, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Arise and eat. Verse 6, and he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and he lay down again. Have you ever been so worn out? You're like, you know, I'll get up and eat, but after that, I'm going back to bed. Anybody identify with that one? I think we've all been there. Verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came to him a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Now, we read this, the history of Elijah, and we say, wow, this guy was absolutely incredible. He was absolutely incredible. Actually, this is what it looks like to, be, to live a, a fully surrendered life filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, I've mentioned this before, uh, he had this to say about Elijah in chapter 5, verse 17 of his book. He said, Elijah was as completely human as we are. He was just like all the rest of us. The Bible's not about uh, extraordinary people, but God doing extraordinary things through ordinary people, okay? And that's important. A mental health counselor uh, looking at Elijah's story would say at this point in the narrative that he is triggered and he's dysregulated. Let me explain that. A trigger is something that sets you off. Now, I know that, that you're not familiar with that. In this culture, okay, uh, but that's what a trigger is. It's something that just basically ticks you off, and you're done. You're tired of it. Jezebel announces a hit on Elijah, and he loses it. He was afraid, and he ran for his life. He wanted to die. He's triggered, and he's dysregulated. Let me explain that second part. When you're regulated, you control your emotions. When you're dysregulated, your emotions control you, okay? So why did this death this, this death threat, this hit that he hears about, why did it trigger and dysregulate him? Because he had had death threats before. He had been under, he, he had a bounty on his head before. What was different about this time? Well, we don't really know, but I think it's a pretty, thing, a pretty easy thing to figure out if you study his story. I believe it's safe to say, uh, after all he's been through, if there was ever a good candidate for burnout, Elijah's that guy. He's that guy. Uh, he, he's burned out, we'll talk about each of these, he's burned out physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and mentally. Everything in his life breaks down at the same time. Now, so let's, let's break it down. He, he's burned out physically. He's been on the run for three and a half years, and it says, quote, he laid down and he slept under a broom tree. He's just tired. Have you ever been there? I mean, just really wore out. You're like, I'm just tired. I love Jesus and all. But, you know, I've hit my limit. That's where he's at. He's completely done with it all. There's no fight left in him. He's, he's also burned out emotionally. There hadn't been rain for three and a half years. And because he prophesied it, he prayed it, he prayed it publicly, and it came to pass, the people hated his guts. They couldn't stand this guy. The entire kingdom is adversely affected and, and there's issues here that everybody are having to deal with. The people look at Elijah and say, you've destroyed everything. You've, you've ruined our lives. You've ruined our land, our crops, our livestock, our livelihood. It's all gone. So we're coming for you now. We're, we're going we're gonna to collect that bounty on your head. He's hated and he's despised. Now, some of us, if one person goes public against us, we're triggered and we're, we're dysregulated. Okay, how do you know? Well, I know a guy. <laughs> you, you make a, a post on Facebook and one person out of your 2,774 friends, <laughs> I know a guy, <laughs> maligns your motives, right? And they ream you out for having an original thought and you're like, oh my God, do I delete it? Do I, do I block? Um, you know, do I take a social media break? Do I go into hiding? Do I just keep my mouth shut? Do I respond? What do I do? And that's just one person. This dude had an entire nation after him, an entire nation. They all hate you from top to bottom. Imagine that. That's what Elijah was going through. So emotionally, he's exhausted. He's burned out. He's done. Okay. Next, he's burned out relationally. 
Uh, he sends away an unnamed servant before he goes who apparently had been faithful to him uh, during the duration of all this ordeal and this conflict with Ahab and Jezebel. This guy, whoever he is, has been right by his side. But now he tells him, look, I'm going in the wilderness all by myself. I don't need you. I just need to be by myself for a little while. You've never heard that in your house, have you? I ju just leave me alone. I just need to be by myself for a little while, right? He's trusting nobody. He's in a dark place. He needs to be left alone. He's also burned out mentally. He's like, God, can this just be over? Could you just end my life and take me out of this mess? He's in a bad place. And if you found Elijah under that tree in the wilderness and said, do you realize uh, how powerful your ministry has been, the miracles that God has, has wrought in the land because of you, the powerful things of God that we've seen. God has been good to you, Elijah. God has been good to you. You need to get up and get going. Get back in the game. You're a mighty man of God. If you could have found him and said all that stuff, Elijah would probably have looked at you and said, would you just shut up and leave me alone? Right. See, some of you identify with that, don't you? Amen? So we've been there. Some of you are there right now. You're under that tree in the wilderness. And there are times, there are seasons in your life that you just need to be left alone. You need to figure it out and you need to map it out and you need to be able to walk it out. You see, Elijah is still filled with the Holy Spirit and he loves the Lord, but there's a demonic assault that comes against him. We've been talking a lot about those demonic assaults. As soon as Jezebel makes a deal with the devil, the demonic is deployed to come against Elijah to oppress him. Now, we're not talking about possession, but we are talking about oppression. And most people that are trying to make a difference in the kingdom of God are going to face oppression from demonic assault, okay? You just need to know that. This is where I love, uh, I love uh, counselors and doctors. I'm not against this at all. I believe in what's called integrative care. Uh, I believe we should take everything from the sciences and the social sciences as well as the scripture. I've listened to a lot of other pastors talk about this, and I concur. I agree with uh, this, this mentality that these things can blend together and that they can help a lot of people to come out of these dark seasons of their lives. But I want to say something that most of my friends have not said, and I think it's important. I believe, again, we should take as much as we can and learn as much as we can, uh, but also from Scripture, general and special revelation. I think we should learn from everything, okay? But let me say this, and I can't overstate this. This is extremely important. If you don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit and the assaults from the demonic realm to destroy people's lives, then you will not know how to help people who are struggling with deep spiritual depression, Elijah is under a spiritual, demonic attack. If a psychologist had been able to sit Elijah down in his office for a session, it would have probably went something like this. Or a therapist, whatever. How's your blood pressure? Let's check that. How's your heart rate? Do you have any migraines? Are you sleeping enough? Let's get you on some antidepressants. Listen, they could have psychoanalyzed Elijah until the end of time, and it would not have made one bit of difference. Not one bit of difference. He was in a spiritual battle. He was in a spiritual battle. His problem was demonic oppression. He wasn't possessed, but he was being oppressed. And I know some of you identify with what I'm saying, and maybe you've never thought of this this way before. You've been through it, though. You sat on the counselor's couch, and you did everything they told you to do, but none of it worked for you. You're still in a dark place, and you even wish I'd shut up. You're like, I didn't know you are talking about this, or I'd have skipped it today, Okay? Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. He was afraid. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. We know God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, right? God does not give us the spirit of fear. Then where does it come from? Fear comes from demonic oppression. The devil sends demons to assault you. I don't know why, you know, people will go, I don't know why I feel like this. I'm not myself today. I just want to be left alone. Cut the lights off. Close the blinds. Go away. Leave me alone. I'm not doing good. I'm having a really bad, bad day. It could be demonic oppression. You can be fighting a spiritual battle and feel that way, okay? Listen, I, I experience demonic attacks in my ministry, in my personal life, often. And if you believe it's wrong to admit it publicly from the podium, then you haven't been listening. Yeah. 
you haven't been listening. Elijah is honest about it, okay? He's like, I'm not doing good. I'm in a bad place, Lord. Why not just end my life and take me out of this mess right now like today? We need to be honest. We don't, we don't have to pretend that everything is wonderful when we're struggling, when we're in a bad place, when we're hurting, when our lives are broken, bruised, and battered. You can be honest about it. God has a, a plan and a solution to help you walk out of it. Anybody interested in that part of this? Three lessons we learned from Elijah's spiritual depression. Number one, for every ministry, there's an anti-ministry. If you've ever done ministry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Elijah's in the will of God. He's doing the ministry of the Lord. Ahab and Jezebel are now, because they know that he's doing something that's righteous and holy, they're intentionally going to oppose him and everything that he does in the name of God, Jehovah. That's anti-ministry. For every ministry, there is an anti-ministry. The devil's going to make sure of it. Every credible ministry doing the work of God in the world will face demonic opposition. Okay, important here. This is why some people uh, come to church. You know, they come into church and, and they, see, they see some rumblings and they hear things and, and they're, you know, they see disruptions and they see uh, discord and they're like, what's going on here? There, there's so much conflict and criticism and, and people don't, don't like the way things are going and I need to go to a church that's got some peace. Let me say something about that. Welcome to God-ordained ministry. The only ministries that never face resistance are ministries already surrendered to Satan. Fill in those blanks. Amen. There's nothing left for him to do because he's already controlling it. He's not going to bother that. When he's got control, there's nothing more for him to, to do. Number two, since I got a little tug on that, let's keep going. The stronger the anointing, the deeper the suffering. Elijah has a powerful anointing. As a result, he's experiencing very deep suffering. Think about this. Jesus had the strongest anointing that's ever been recorded in Scripture. He, in the history of the world, he endured the, the deepest suffering. He was tortured and he was murdered on the cross. The night before his crucifixion, he can't sleep. He's filled with anxiety and he's sweating profusely. Scripture references and said as, as though it were great drops of blood. And he tells his father, I don't know if I can do this. If there's another way, let's do that. But if not, not my will, Lord, Father, but your will be done. That's Jesus. That's Jesus talking, right? Some people see a ministry under attack and they think, well, that ministry's going through it. It must not be of God or God would be blessing it abundantly and they would just be booming and, you know, just moving forward without any opposition. If it was anointed, they wouldn't be having so much trouble. No, it's exactly the opposite. According to Scripture, it's exactly the opposite. The stronger the anointing, the greater the suffering, the greater the resistance, the greater the pushback. Number three, this is important to me. You may not get anything out of it, but if you're a leader in the room, any leaders that are in management or anything like that in the room, that you're, you have people that work under your authority, okay, you're going to love this part of the sermon. You're going to like it. The leader who calls the shots will take the shots. Huh? Let's talk about that. A lot of people want to lead until they realize, hey, I like calling the shots, but I don't, I don't want to take the shots. In, in 1 Kings 18, 13, Elijah runs into another godly prophet named Obadiah. And this was just like revelation to me. I, I heard another preacher talk specifically about this, and, and I've kind of taken a little deeper dive on it. And I thought, Lord, help me to, to present this with integrity and in a way that, that will help people to understand what, what is happening. If you're a leader, this is going to help you. So lean in. But Elijah runs into another godly prophet named Obadiah, and Elijah is all, all alone. He's standing all alone. He has nobody to support him. And Obadiah's like, Elijah, you're not alone. I have a hundred other prophets, two groups of 50, in, in two different caves, and I've hid them from Jezebel. She's killed all the other prophets, but I've got these safely hidden. Elijah, here's, here's the part we never, we, we generally reprimand Elijah because he's feeling all alone. I submit to you today, he's still all alone. He's still all alone because he's out in the open taking all the shots and they're hiding in a cave taking none of it. Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, you know, Elijah's out in the open opposing Ahab and Jezebel all by himself. Do you know when the 100 prophets hiding in the caves show up? Never. 
They never, they never do. They're like, we're praying for you, Elijah. We admire the way God is using you, brother. But they never come out of hiding to stand with him. Whoever calls the shots takes the shots, and Elijah has a great big old bullseye on his chest. During this series, I'm going to be honest with you now, okay? During this series, I've tackled a number of hot-button issues, cultural, societal issues that our nation is dealing with, from abortion all the way to the transgender debate, even transitional surgeries on minor children, mutilation on minor children. And I got a few amens in here, okay? Um, and I appreciated that. But until you stand up out there, it doesn't really matter about your amens in here. Right. I've taken some shots for it. Um, yeah. We've had some families leave our church over it because they didn't think I did a good job separating the political from the biblical. I disagree with that. I adamantly disagree with that. But that's how they feel. Listen, I'm going to say this as emphatically and as adamantly as I possibly can. The demonic spirits of Ahab and Jezebel are attacking not just our world today. Remember, I've been telling you don't just see the story but look through the story. How, does it, how is it still relevant to us today? Demonic spirits are not just actively engaging and attacking our world today. They're attacking Christians and Christian churches as well. So severe are the demonic assaults that a lot of churches identify as everything, pun intended, they identify as everything but a Christian church these days. That's a problem. That's a big problem. They've been so busy redefining and affirming sin, the Holy Spirit is disregarded, and it's hard to determine who or what they're worshiping now. It's going to get quiet again. I don't care. It is what it is. I love you. Thank you. Obadiah safely hid 100 prophets to keep them from being slaughtered by Jezebel, and they never came out of the cave. They, 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 they held on to their hiding place. They never stood with Elijah, the prophet of God. He stood alone. Listen, I know it's comfortable in the cave. And I know as soon as you go public, like I did on social media a few weeks ago, I got a lot of likes, but I can get a lot of shares. Just saying. Do you understand that terminology? I know most of you do, right? A lot of people liked it, but they didn't want to share it. But why? Because that puts a bullseye on your chest too. And, and so let me finish this up like this. I know it's comfortable in the cave, but if we're going to be rapture ready, we've got to stand up and we've got to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 is my life verse. You've got to speak the truth in love. There's a right way to do it. Okay, so let's land this plane and then we'll be done. <clears throat> Over the last six weeks... We have looked at Elijah. I get nervous when I, when I get to preaching like that. Amen. And my mouth gets real dry. <laughs> Over the last six weeks, we've looked at Elijah, but I'd like to toss Jonah in the mix for a quick comparison. Think about this. Man, I've read a lot of books, and I've listened to a lot of sermons, and I've gotten a lot of great thoughts from other people, and I admired this one so much, I had to put it in this, this to close this out. But God told them both, he said, go to this place. He, he told Elijah and Jonah the same thing, basically their message. They're going to different places, but this was the word of the Lord. He told both guys, go to this place and minister to these people. And they both ran away out of fear for their own lives. They both sat alone under a tree, and they both told God that they wanted to die, looking at the comparison. Now, pay attention because this is crazy good. Pay attention to how God deals with each one because he doesn't deal with them the same way. God rebukes Jonah, but he restores Elijah. What's the difference? God chases Jonah down and, and has a, a stern conversation with him that goes something like this, and I paraphrase, why are you running away so upset, big boy? What's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. You're a racist. That's what he's telling Jonah. You're a racist. You have a problem with the people. You don't love the people. In fact, you hate them so much, you wish I'd just kill them all. 
I'd just destroy them all. Just get them out of your way, out of your life. God takes off his belt and he gives Jonah a butt whipping. Now, millennials in Gen Z, you don't have a clue what I just said. And I can tell that you don't a lot of, a lot of the time. I love you, but boy, discipline's a wonderful thing in the world. God doesn't rebuke Elijah. He doesn't take his belt off to Elijah. He doesn't rebuke him. In fact, he restores him. Here's why. Here's why. Don't miss this. Jonah is bad. Elijah is broken. Jonah is bad. Elijah is broken. Sometimes broken people will, will act out and do bad things too. But here's the thing we better be thankful for. God sees the heart. God knows the thought and the intent of the heart. And God looked at Jonah's heart and he said, that's bad. That's really bad. You're a racist. God looked at Elijah's heart and he said, you're broken. I, I can fix this. We can work on this. This is why when we see people behaving badly, we, we must ask, are, are they bad or are they broken? Elijah's like, God, I can't do this anymore. Just take my life away from me. I don't want to be here. Elijah had obeyed God. Now he's broken as a result of his obedience. Jonah didn't obey. God's trying to chase him down and turn him around and get him going back where he told him to go to Nineveh. He's trying to, trying to get him to obey. Jonah is bad. Elijah is broken. Now, in your own life, when you're sinning and struggling and suffering, you got to ask yourself, is it because I'm bad or is it because I'm broken? For Elijah, he's a good man. He's a man of God. He's just broken. And God has a plan to put him back together. Okay? Now, I've got to give you this real quick. Uh, God's plan to heal spiritual depression. And I know a lot of us in the room deal with depression. Uh, I purposeful, purposefully invited a number of my friends to be in this service today or to tune in that I personally know that deal with this depression. This is the application. This is my uh, two, two bits or two cents to try to get you to walk out of it or to step out of it. So God's plan to heal spiritual depression. Number one, everybody say sleep. He lay down and he slept. When you're not doing good, look at somebody and say, go to bed. Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus. Amen? Mark 4, 38. He went to sleep in the bow of the ship. They're all under all this tension, and Jesus is sleeping through it. He took a nap. Right? Sometimes a lot of the problems that comes with depression, and my wife can tell you this is true for me, when I'm only getting three or four or five hours of sleep a night, I can function pretty high off of six or seven hours, but I don't do so well off of three or four, okay? And I don't know, you, you, some of you think you function real high off of three or four, but you need to ask other people, do I? I got a feeling you'll be shocked at the answer. You may be checking a lot of boxes, but you're probably destroying a lot of relationships, you need to get some rest. Number two is divine touch. 1 Kings 19 and 5, an angel touched him and said to him, there are places in your life that you, you, you just need to invite the Holy Spirit to touch you. And, and this demonic oppression invites, you know, just like the devil would dispatch demons to come against us, God has the ability to dispatch angels, ministering spirits to come and deliver us. Okay, so don't ever forget that. It's vitally important. We all need a divine touch sometimes. When we have this prayer line, I have been blown away to see several hundred people in each service walk through that prayer line. You know what you're saying? I'm being attacked by the enemy, and I don't know how to walk out. I need somebody to pray over me now. I need somebody to get a prayer through so that those who are strong can bear the infirmities of the weak, and you can help me walk out of this place, right? I love the prayer line. Amen. We got some Baptist folk been helping us pray and some Presbyterians. Y'all ain't going to be able to keep claiming to be Baptists and Presbyterians. You're eventually going to have to cross over and say, I'm a non-denominational. I go to Cross Point Church. We just do everything there, whatever the Lord leads. Okay? <laughs> so there are places in your life that you just need to invite the Holy Spirit to touch you. Holy Spirit, that, that trauma that I keep reliving, I need you to touch that. Holy Spirit, that divorce, the loss, the miscarriage, the betrayal, could you touch that area of my life? The angel spoke to him, listen, 
The best way to get a word from God is to spend time in the word of God. You, you don't have to go see a prophet. You don't have to be, have somebody give a word over you. Just open your Bible. And whatever area that you're struggling in, take a deep dive in the word of God that, that relates to those areas of struggle. There's a, a way out of every situation that you'll ever face in life. It's, it's already written about and talked about in Scripture, and God will help you walk out of it in Jesus' name. So you need to take a, a deeper dive into the Word of God and find out what He has to say about the mess that you're in. Number three, this is hard for me to talk about. If I only preach the good stuff that, that I do, I wouldn't talk about stuff like this. Everybody write down the word nutrition. Laugh at me, you bunch of hypocrites. But God says several times, arise and eat. Look, you cannot change what you refuse to confront, okay? Um, so I'm going to give you a chance to take a big step by being honest before God and all these witnesses. How many of you in the room and even watching online are honest enough to say, PT, I could do a whole lot better in the area of nutrition. Some of us need to raise two hands. Amen? Amen? I think we all know this, okay? Um, Lennox this past week, you know, we did the trick-or-treating thing in our neighborhood, and we don't celebrate the devil. It's, it's about the candy for us. <laughs> we couldn't care less. I, me and Jason was talking about this this week. We don't do the demons and all that stuff that people kind of, you know, embellish during this season. We want the candy. That's all we care about. We want the candy. So... He did real good. He filled up this bag, and towards the end of the night, people that's sitting on their front porch still have all this candy. That's the time to hit them up because they want it gone. Yeah. So Lennox is piling it on, and, and, from the, and he's not waiting till we got home. He's sitting in the back seat, and he's eating. He's eating candy. He's picking it out, and he's eating. This is Thursday night, right? So, and then it continued on. He's, he's very sneaky. This, this happened at the house too, right? He kept eating. He just kept piling on. So they were happy to give him to me Friday night for him to spend a night with me. Okay? So we go to Second and Charles, and, I, you know, I, I kind of, it was the end of the ball season, and I like, to, I like to spend a little money on Linux once in a great while. Lord Jesus, forgive me for lying right here in front of all these people. But, but we went to Second and Charles, and we're walking, and he's not acting like himself. And I'm like, are you okay? I'm okay. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm okay. And he's looking at stuff, and he picked up some little cheap trinket. I said, that's what you want? Yes, yeah, sir. I need to go to the bathroom, Papa. <laughs> and then he just threw up all in the aisle. And I'm like, oh, my God, this isn't my area. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't deal well with this. I, you, if you throw up in front of me, I'm going to throw up in front of you. Okay? True story. I finally get him to the bathroom, and four more times, heathen. And he looked up at me. He said, how much longer is this going to last? I'm like, oh, God, I don't know, but I'm hoping it's about over, you know? That's what bad nutrition will do to you. What a great sermon illustration. You, you understand and you relate, right? That's what bad, you ever ate something at night you knew you didn't need to, and then the next morning you wake up and you just can't hardly get going? That's what sugar does to you. Sugar's going to crash after about seven, eight hours, right? And you're not going to feel good, but we can all do better in the area of nutrition. When we're burned out, here's what we do. We tend to lean toward the energy drinks, the caffeine, the sugar, and the adrenaline to keep our, our bodies moving. Look, we need to figure out what's healthy and nutritious and lean into that. And I'm as guilty as anybody else in the room. I'm stomping all over my own toes. I'm trying to do better. I haven't had a choice this year because of some health problems. I can't eat certain things anymore. I miss them terribly. Uh, I struggle with that, but I'm doing a lot better in this area, but not still as good as I need to be. Okay, so our body and our soul, here's the thing, our body and our souls are connected. God created us this way, and we're always going to struggle with burnout if our body is not functioning well. Okay, number four, and you're going to think this is a contradiction. It is not. Write the word feasting. Feasting. First Kings 19.6 says, God baked him a cake. <laughs> you think I'm leaving this part out? No. God baked him a cake. 
I heard a pastor recently say, and I agree with him, that we don't have enough Bible teaching on baking cakes. We need to talk about it more. And how many of you like cake? Raise your hand. I thought so. A cake, here's the thing about a cake, though. I can go buy nothing but cakes, places of the devil. <laughs> it's hard for me to drive by. And we're not celebrating anything. And I'll use the small group as an excuse. I'll get, I'll get this for the small group. They'll, you don't even to eat any, you know, when we do this. And they, they left the last time I did this, and it was all still there. I'm like, oh, dear God, I'm in trouble now. They didn't eat any of this cake. But a cake is supposed to come out, okay? And let me explain this. A cake usually comes out when we're celebrating something, a milestone, a birthday, an anniversary, or maybe a big win, right? Let's talk about that real quick, and then we'll be done. I believe God gave Elijah cake to say, you know what, Elijah, you've been a faithful servant. You've had some really big wins. Let's celebrate that. Blow out the candles and have yourself a piece of cake. Now, one of the principles for church growth is, is called celebrating the big wins. That's why Josh comes out here every week, and he's going to say something like this. Hey, Cross Point, we had four students get saved Wednesday night, or we baptized eight people last Sunday. We call that celebrating the win. Have a piece of cake, God said. Celebrate the win. The devil knows if you focus only on what you've lost, he can keep you down and defeated. But if you learn to celebrate the wins that God gives, the devil is silenced. Look at somebody and say, have a piece of cake. Everybody participated in that one. I appreciate it. And number five is worship. And I don't have time to get into this very much. But in the last verses of 1 Kings 19, God sends Elijah two Two places identified as places of worship, Beersheba and Mount Sinai in, or Horeb. Uh, it was God telling Elijah, it's time to get up and go to church. It's time to get up and go to church. Remember when churches were forced to close during COVID? That was a horrible time. We couldn't worship together. We couldn't pray and sing together or encourage one another. Praise team, come on up. After months of isolation, studies showed, and they already knew this. They just held the information back, but studies showed drastic mental health decline among our children who had been isolated for months and months and months, and also among our, among our adults. 20% of the churches in America permanently closed during the shutdown. PT, are you saying when people abandon church, their spiritual mental health declines? Are you saying they end up like Elijah in a depressed, dark place? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. How many of you come in here, you're like, you know, I'm not the only Christian. I can come to church and there's going to be a room full of people that's in the same boat that I am. They've been fighting the devil all week long. And you get here and you just want to know, can somebody pray with me? Can somebody pray with me? Or can I pray for you? Can I serve you in some way? Can we just sing and worship and praise God and be in this place for a while and shut out all the crazy going on in the world? And maybe Jesus comes down and he meets with us just like he did with Elijah. Sometimes praise and worship helps us to shut out all the mess that's going on outside of these walls right here today. Amen? Let me just close with this. Elijah wasn't doing well, but God met with him. And I'm praying that if you're not doing well, that God would meet with you today. And I want you to know that we're trying to make Crosspoint like the place where God met with Elijah. We want this to be a place of healing. Would you stand with me all over the room? That last point, I should go back and add this. Whenever you're taking things off the calendar to try to make some margin, create some margin in your life, don't erase church. You be real careful about before you erase church. You need corporate worship in your life. When I can't be here, I'm not okay. When I can't get here, I'm not okay. Elijah's isolated for a long time. He needed church. God knew it. You need church. God knows that too. Let me pray for you. Father God, would you speak to the people in this room? I know that spiritual depression is a real battle that a lot of people here are facing, that they're dealing with, and some have never been diagnosed. They've never even done a self-diagnosis to realize that a lot of the problem, a lot of the despair, the feeling of rejection and dejection that they're, they're feeling is a spiritual oppression from demons that are assaulting our lives, trying to push us further away from God. But I pray for healing. I pray for wholeness. I pray the hand of God be real in their lives. And Father, that you do something that only you can do. Show up. And Father, we've been talking about 
the cause and cures of depression this morning. But Lord, can you help us now to focus on the cure? We need to stand up. We need to do something. We need to be, Lord, we need to be assertive, aggressive, Lord, and getting ourselves to a better place. Help us to do it, Father, because once we get the wheels moving, you show up and powerfully, God, you anoint us for the, for the, for the mission of finding our way back into your presence and your glory is seen. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said...